Today is the fourth day of the June 86 retreat. Yesterday we talked quite a bit about awareness. Awareness being without focus, without judgment, <coughs> without self-reference <coughs> at the instant of awareness No sense of me confronting you or in opposition to others or as a separate entity from the song of the bird, the clouds, the trees, the wind. Someone said, yes, there has, have been instances like that, but I don't really know whether I want that. looking at it together, inquiring together into this. The person said was something like this. I'm afraid I won't remain an individual. And it's taken me quite a number of years to become this individual, to put it all together. Please remember, this is not verbatim as best as I can. It doesn't matter what was said verbatim. I'm afraid that in this awareness of which there has been a taste, I will not continue as me. As an individual. In talking about this right now, is it possible not to listen to this as a lecture about something, but to look to think and look here as the talk is proceeding because what is being talked about is not one person but all of us. If we are aware of it or not, this problem exists for all of us. The assumption or deeply felt sense of being a separate individual and connected with that 
the fear of not continuing, be it through this work or the fear of dying. Through sickness or through an accident or through old age, it is the same fear of not continuing as an individual. So let's try to start from a simple a base, as simple a, a start as possible. This is what was done in the meeting. In asking what made for the sense of individuality, the person said, I'm sitting here and you're sitting there. There's a pain in this body that I'm feeling, you're not feeling it. There is a perception of, listen, we call it the birds, the wind, but we talked yesterday about the fact it's not the word, it's not the image, it's And this perception, the person said, is different from me as it is for you. Let us look at this. Stop with these two things and look at them in depth. I'm sitting here, you're sitting there, 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 there. We're all sitting someplace. That's a fact which holds true for all of us, that we're each sitting in a different place. And from where I'm sitting and from where you and you and everyone else is sitting, as one looks up, there's a different vista. That holds true for each one of us. One person may be short-sighted, the other one far-sighted, and another one have normal vision. We all have a different vision. As a matter of fact, no two bodies are completely alike. Not even the bodies of one egg twins are alike. That is a fact that holds true for all of us. The pain in the knee is felt here. And for you, and you, and him, and her, it's felt somewhere. Maybe there's no pain at this moment, but the next moment there may be pain, or tomorrow. There may be pain. We all feel pain at one time or another, maybe all the time. That holds true for all of us that when there is a certain sensation, a certain dysfunction or whatever the cause may be, the stimulus may be, it is felt as pain or it is felt. We, we are so constituted that the brain and all the nerves very sensitive, and can also interpret what is being felt through past experience. It holds true for all of us, 
for all human beings. There's the same, even though each brain, each leg, each nervous system is different, all of us, to some extent or another, feel pain. I don't feel the pain that is occurring in your leg and you don't feel the pain that's occurring in my back. So there are slight variations, but pain is felt. I think so far we've been very factual about this. Where does the feeling of I come in? The feeling of that this is my pain, my perception, my body. What is that? When we say it's my pain, it's my pain I feel. It is my perception of the song of the bird. It's my view. My body. What is that when we say that? On what basis do we say that? What, what gives us the basis for saying it? What are the data for it? We can say, well, I've always said that. It's a habit. Or we can see instantly as we say, this is me that this is thought, isn't it? The pain, the perception of the pain, the perception of the bird song, the fact that this body is different from that, 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 this, these are facts, undeniable. That the view from here is different from the view from there is undeniably so. To say this is my view, if it is more than descriptive of the fact that there is a different view from here than it is from there. That's a fact. But there is ownership expressed in my body, my pain, my perception, and my view, my individuality. And what is the basis for the feeling, for this strong feeling of, of ownership? There being an owner of, of what? Of what we just said. Of all one's past experiences, one's abilities, one's talents, one's accomplishments, one's training. In that we all vary again in talents, in abilities, and the way we grew up. Each one of us grew up differently. To a certain extent we'll talk about in what we all are like. But our personal experiences, even those of one egg twins, have different personal experiences. Mother goes for a walk and has each one by one hand. This one sees something different from the other one. One may see a horrible accident and the other one, the other one not.
So we've all had different impressions, different education, different socioeconomic upbringing, maybe not completely different, but slightly different. We may have grown up in a different country, different language, different customs. Holds true for all humanity, some of these differences. And yet, all human beings or maybe most human beings have this deep sense of being me, a self, a separate entity. And the basis for that is, isn't it? Let's look at it. Ideas one has about oneself as being separate, that in itself, please, Check this out for yourself. Don't, don't believe in what I say or take somebody's word for it. This is, this is explorable by each one of us. What, what makes up for the sense of self, whether it is in these images that we have, not just one or two, but varying with the people we're with, the circumstances we're in, the aspirations we have, which change all the time. Images about our past, our past hardships or pleasures. All of it coming out of memory, where it is stored, and all contributing to the sense of this is me. The fact that there is a pain here that may different, be different from a pain there or a different view, a different body, a different background, a different capacity in the brain or in the body, in the muscles. Is that fact contributing to saying this is me? Is it necessary to say me, this is I, I have this body, I've had this background, I've had these experiences? It may facilitate communication, but is one aware that it is a means of communication to say I, or does one believe that there is an entity in the middle of all of that, which has all of that. The feeling is so strong, and yet one can open it up to investigation, to look. What makes up the sense of I? just at this moment. If one says, I hear the wind in the trees, the sound is real. But saying, I hear it, what's the reality of that other than the reality of thought? A 
And if one questions this, this thought of I, then does there come the fear, I may not be real, I may not continue as this entity to which there is a strong attachment. We are strongly attached to the images that we have of ourselves. If one begins to observe this, one can be amazed at the strength of attachment to the image we trying to project to others, trying to have confirmed or affirmed by others. The tremendous pain of the image is hurt by others. The tremendous elation of the image is flattered. Approved of. If somebody says, I love you, what does that do? Not to skip over that and just say, it feels, makes me feel so good. What is it that makes one feel good? Isn't there immediately tremendous imagery involved of me being lovable? And the image of the person who said that becomes deposited, remembered in the brain. Wanting to hear that again. Because what boosts or, or approves of our image gives us energy, good feelings throughout the body. All the organs respond to this signal in the brain. And what hurts the image is likewise felt throughout the body. Anger, depression, fear. So the sense of individuality, being a separate individual, a separate self, a me, an I, whichever way we put it, is it anything more than the images that we have built up about ourselves, based on our whole background. Again, not denying the fact that each one of us has had a different background, has different characteristics, different personalities, a different physique, different gender, different age, different looks. So do the birds out there. No two robins hopping around there on the meadow are alike. We may just call it a robin and then not look, because we have an image. But if one examined each bird very carefully, one may find differences among each one of them. Each one was born, maybe in the same nest, but not in the same position. One egg was on this side, the other egg was here. One was fed first, the other one second. Sometimes you see in these movies that one, one of them always gets fed first. You feel really sorry for the other one. <laughs> <laughs> it's so aggressive practically goes into the gullet of the mother to get it, get it first. Not first, but to get it. 
I think the idea first is projected. Just to get it as quickly as possible. And the other one, one movie I saw, the mother had to be really very creative to get out of the way of that first one to the other one. To get something in there quickly before, before the other one got it out of her, her beak. So there are different backgrounds for robins or birds. This one's robins, so another bird. And yet, to function very freely, maybe that's already a projection, but it looks that way. To function, let's just say to function. That robin does not have to say, I, I'm functioning, I'm getting a worm now. My home is there, these are my children. It's, it's not necessary. The brain in the robin doesn't have that provision for storing images about who he is or who she is. The images of worms, probably, and of the, the mate and of the babies to recognize, or maybe partial images, not the whole. Certain forms serve for recognition. But this whole process that is available in the human brain of self-reflection, <clears throat> building, storing images of oneself like photographs or movies, and then saying, this is me. And then the attachment to these images. This is unique, I believe, for human beings. At least the, the consequences of that, as evidence in our human relationships or lack of relationship, is nowhere else found among the animals. The mutual hatreds and destruction that has gone on since human beings have existed almost. Which, if we examine it carefully, factually, not emotionally, has as a central component this feeling of me or us versus them my identity or our identity versus their identity and the irreconcilable conflicts needing to convert the others or get territory from the others to get it for ours. What about this fear of not continuing as an individual? It's been mentioned several times in this retreat. I'm not so sure I want this awareness if it means that I'm not going to be there. And if we question into it, we find that the fear is usually, I may not have my pleasures. I don't want to give up, that I would be afraid of losing. And the plain fear of not, not being. Now, in looking at this right now, that is 
thinking, isn't it? That is speculation. Using thought to anticipate what would happen if something that is an idea, namely awareness without a self, would continue forever, then the logical deduction from this, then there would be no self. And me and my pleasures or uh, feelings would, would end. One doesn't know how it would be. This is speculation. It's the brief moment that one glimpses this, or oh, one is this wholeness, no, no separation, no me there to fear or, or want. That's the very essence of that state. There is no wanting and no fearing. No wanting to, that, that idea doesn't enter the mind, wanting to continue. Because when there's awareness, where is there room for thinking about continuing? That is a totally irrelevant, extraneous activity. And the energy is not channeled into that center of the brain where this activity takes place. The energy is in, in being, where, where, where one is. Without the sense of being a separate individual, that is brain activity into which the energy is not channeled. So the, the essence of that is no fear. And no want. It is only when that's that's another process that our brain has installed in it. A a mechanism. I'm using very awful words for a brain specialist. There are none here. To instantly find out what am I up to, what's going on, and to represent to oneself through words, symbolically, words are symbols, abstractions, we talked about it yesterday, the word is not the real thing, but the brain has the ability to represent symbolically what just happened in words and image. And in that we feel very secure. That mechanism, which can be called our instant playback, gives us a sense of orientation, a sense of existing even if the instant playback says you're in a bad way, you're depressed, you're in despair, uh, still that mechanism operates. And without it, if that doesn't operate, if that's quiet, there is, there is no knowing what knowing through words, through symbols, what is happening. It's just what's happening, that's clear. It doesn't need words, with which I'm not saying it's bad to put in words, to represent in words what is happening. There's nothing bad about it. We're doing it right now, we're doing it in talks, and it may be helpful by putting into words what is happening to see what's happening. That's the amazing thing. That understanding 
intellectually what is happening may allow one to hear something without words. And then, does one immediately want to know what happened to me? And can one see that this instant playback in picture and word is not the actual occurrence? That's an abstraction, it's a condensation, a, a yeah, something other than the real happening. It's separate from it. And if one continues in that, saying to oneself, oh, what just happened was there was an awareness without self, then all one knows and imagines can be spun out into an enormous web of if this continues, and there, there was no self, one says to oneself, then this means that if I were in awareness all the time, I would be without a self, and I would not continue, and my pleasures wouldn't continue. What I've built up for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years would all be for naught and the fear, and then the resistance to even look again because of this web of thought and imagination and fantasy, speculation, that the brain is ever capable of spinning. So is it possible if there is this awareness where there is no feeling of self, no fear or want, and the mechanism sets in, this is what is happening right now, to see it for what it is and not become entangled in this as though this was our real world. This is how we live most of the time. We live in our thoughts and images as though this was all real not realizing that it is thought, a thought web made up of past impressions and projections into the future from those past impressions. And from that we scare ourselves silly. I, I, did this once recently, no, not so recently. I think I've mentioned it in a talk. <clears throat> Having gone through a very dangerous time in my youth, childhood and youth, there was every occasion for, for fear and anguish, which I had plenty of. And once trying to think remember what all the things were that I was afraid of. And a list piled up very quickly in the mind. And then I tried to remember what of all of that came true. There was hardly anything. None of these fears, almost none of them, ever came true. And the things that did happen one was able to meet. One has to meet. What choice does one have? When, when the house is burning, you get out, unless you're paralyzed with fear. You get out or you, you find a way of putting out the fire. And the, the organism has incredible resources at the moment of crisis. Particularly if this crisis has not been anticipated, thought about, it's there. And there's the action.
So can one begin to see how one's pains and sorrows and pleasures are created in thoughts, remembering and anticipating imagery, even at a joyful moment, can one see that there may be images even there? I am joyful. That's the end of it already. But so quickly do we want to, to, to make an image of it. And then enjoy the image of it rather than the real thing. And live in separation. And not, not, not in reality, in vic vicariously, through thoughts, through ideas, pictures. And the same with our pains and sufferings, sorrows. Not that there isn't real sorrow, real pain, but has one ever touched it nakedly, immediately, with no prayer, no device, no hope, nothing coming in between, just that, as it is. We don't know what it is, because we, we escape into our thoughts. We may even escape into the image of being a martyr, a victim which is which gives pleasure. One may complain about one's pains and problems. Let's look whether there isn't attachment to the image of being a sufferer of pain or fear, bad fortune. Because through this image one may have gotten attention in the past, pity, compassion from others, and that's remembered in the brain. So this role yields something, this image will yield something. If the pity doesn't come, then there's resentment on top of feeling victimized, resentment about others who don't see one's pain or don't feel one's pain. But we we, we touched upon something very important in sitting in a retreat like this one may get in touch with an, with an ocean of sorrow which goes far beyond one's own personal suffering the sorrow of human beings growing up with parents who are conditioned. Conditioned to live in thought and idea of what this child will be for me or what it isn't for me. Conditioned to their own problems and therefore no, no love and affection for a new human being. That doesn't happen all the time. But we do grow up as totally helpless little beings. Totally exploitable in the presence of a 
an older generation which has been exploited, taken advantage of, bullied around. And this, if there's no awareness of this or energy of attention, gets passed on to the, to the little ones. The stored up anger or resentment that one couldn't express toward the giants who raised one, one can now, as a giant, pass on to the little dwarf. All these fairy tales of dwarfs and giants come from this, from this fact of our human existence. The sorrow of warfare, the results of warfare. Even felt in this country where there hasn't been a war for a long time, but people who have had to go overseas to participate in wars. Killing other people. That one had ideas about what they were, but did not know intimately. As fellow human beings with the same fears, the same hopes. The same problems. How does one deal with this? How does one deal with personal sorrow, personal pain? Even though we were questioning at the beginning of this talk what this whole idea of this being personal really means. Or whether any pain that is, any sorrow felt is part of this universal sorrow and suffering of human beings everywhere, common to all of us. Will one do what we've done for hundreds and thousands of years, escape into our superstructures that we've erected over there? structures of belief. Of work. Occupation. Pleasures. Entertainment. It seems that the, the entertainment industry may, next to the armament industry, be the fastest growing. which is not said that it's wrong to go to a movie. Somebody asked me that. Do I have to get, feel guilty if I go to a movie? If one feels depressed or in, in sorrow, in touch with fear or anger or anguish, can one be in touch with it even though one goes to the movie? If it's there. Not escape from anything when it's there. Not use any kind of device or drug or drugging to drown it out because it will not be drowned out completely. It will work underground. and send up all kinds of symptoms. 
then we try to battle the symptoms. So is, is our problem whether we will continue as we think of ourselves? The hope connected with it and at the same time the uncertainty connected with it that we may not continue? Or is, is our, our problem, <clears throat> our responsibility, to, to look now what we are, what's there, in a thoroughgoing way, not deceiving oneself, going so far and no farther because we're so attached to our image, questioning it, what it is. Not, I must get rid of it, that is, that is not questioning. not only questioning, but seeing and understanding. Seeing how and understanding how sorrow is created. Inevitably, the moment we feel convinced we are separate and we hold on to this image of being separate. There's inevitable sorrow. Alone the sorrow of separation. The fear of not continuing. The fear of being lonely. And out of that, the attachment to someone or something, not to feel lonely. And in that in attachment, inevitably, the fear of losing that person or that something that gives one comfort and security. And if one indeed loses that person or that something, sorrow, sadness, pain, despair, Then will one look at the whole thing or immediately grab for someone else or something else so as just not to feel what's there, what's been there for thousands of years. Not just to wallow in it, we're not talking about this. Sometimes people understand it this way, you seem to advocate wallowing in pain or sorrow. No, to, 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 to see it so clearly, how it arises, how it is created, what its consequences and effects are, and how it can end. end not by growing indifferent to it or drowning oneself in entertainment or work or whatever. How can sorrow end in oneself?
without all of these escapes that were just talked about. Is it possible? And yet, see it? As it engulfs all of us human beings, be in touch with it, and yet also be free of it? It sounds so so impossible, so paradoxical. But I think one can ask this question when we have no choice. We will end here for today.